welcome to tonight's debate. My name is Grace and I'm the chairman and Mrs Manning Bennett is the timekeeper. The adjudicators are Mrs Lowen, Mr Morton and Mr Moritz. The topic of the debate is that Adelaide should welcome Uber. The affirmative team seated to my right is from St Peter's Girls and the negative team seated to my left is from Adelaide High School. The speaking time for this debate is six minutes. A single warning bell will sound one minute before the speaking time and a double bell will sound at the speaking time. A continuous bell may be rung 30 seconds after the speaking time, in which case the speaker must sit down immediately. Please ensure that your mobile phones and other electronic devices are switched off. I declare this, this debate open and call upon the first affirmative, Mila Lakel. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are here this evening to debate the topic that Adelaide should welcome Uber. As the affirmative team for tonight's debate, we will convince you that this is very much the case. So to break down the topic, we define Uber as an on-demand car service allowing private drivers to rent their driving services to the public, picking up and dropping off customers to their desired destinations from a smartphone app. This ride-sharing service being welcomed into Adelaide means that the red tape of regulations in place at the moment should be decreased. However, we are not suggesting that by welcoming Uber, we mean immediately removing all regulations involved in the industry. Nonetheless, we should begin the process of decreasing the red tape surrounding the Uber service. As first speaker tonight, I will discuss the economic benefits of decreasing the red tape which surrounds the Uber service in Adelaide, including the way in which decreasing regulation causes a decrease in barriers of entry into the ride-sharing market and hence introduces more competitors. Our second speaker, Lily, will discuss the social benefits of the service to the consumer. To my first point, Reducing the red tape surrounding the Uber service will allow a decrease in the barriers of entry into the ride-sharing market. Currently in Adelaide, the options for transport in Adelaide are fairly limiting. You can take a bus, a train, a tram, and the only door-to-door -door service is a taxi. Ladies and gentlemen, we can see that in Adelaide at the moment, we are incredibly limited. Decreasing regulations of the ride sharing service will increase entry into the market giving consumers a choice. As stated by Jay Weatherall, in the past taxis had a guaranteed share of the market. Now it's open to the ride sharing business offering consumers a choice. Ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't you agree that as re residents of Adelaide, as consumers, we deserve this choice? So ladies and gentlemen, there will be more competitors in the market. As Australia leans towards the free market model, allowing consumers the choice of which service they would prefer to use, whether it be a taxi, an Uber, or some other ride sharing service, there will hence be an increase in competition for the customer's preference. Due to this driving force, the competition, ride sharing companies such as Uber will be forced to decrease their prices decreasing the cost to the consumer, which I'm sure you would all agree is of course preferable. As these businesses involved in the transport industry are forced to decrease their charges, they must also decrease their costs. This results in an increased efficiency in allocation of, res of resources, assuming of course that the industry is not over-regulated. This more efficient use of factors of production will certainly be beneficial, particularly considering these factors include the use of petrol, which I'm sure you all know is a finite resource and as such is a precious commodity, the way in which workers are used, i.e. The, the way labour is structured, and the servicing of cars, and of course so many other factors. This will be beneficial for society as less resources are required to drive more people more places and therefore it decreases the overall cost. Additionally, this may set a precedent for the opening of other markets 
and therefore increasing consumer choice overall, which we believe is the crux of the argument, in that we believe consumers deserve a greater choice than is currently offered. Although increased competition does place increased pressure on the provider, which is the case in this Uber service, it benefits the consumer. So to sum up my point, as stated by the ACCC in their article about protecting the consumer, when consumers face difficulties in making rational choices, a competitive market may assist in bringing them better outcomes as firms will have an incentive to provide products that make consumers better off, whether they are rational or not. So decreasing the red tape in the uh, surrounding the Uber service will undoubtedly benefit the consumer. So now to my second point. The deregulization of the Uber service in Adelaide will energise the local economy. Although this is stated on the Uber website, it is undeniable that the decreased regulation of Uber will provide all Adelaide residents with a new, flexible earning opportunity. This could be hugely beneficial for students, retirees and many other individuals who require a means of earning additional income. Given Adelaide has a very, very high rate of unemployment, the greatest in Australia according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the introduction of Uber will undoubtedly be beneficial. This is exemplified in London where nearly one third of Uber drivers live in areas where unemployment rates are highest. So decreasing the red tape involved in the Uber service will make it easier for those who are unemployed to become Uber drivers and hence giving them a source of income. Additionally, the resistance to the introduction of Uber to protect dr taxi drivers is misleading. The Department of Transport in the Western Australia states that the, the number of taxi drivers has not decreased since the introduction of the Uber service. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, decreasing the regularisation of the Uber service in Adelaide will be hugely economically beneficial to us as a consumer and to society as a whole. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's debate. Today we're talking about how Uber should not be welcomed in Adelaide and how current regulation in place should not be reduced. <clears throat> Currently, in South Australia, Uber actually is uh, legalised and regulated by the South Australian Government and has been since 2016, and this is according to DIPTI. Um, as first speaker, I will discuss the safety of Uber. And our second speaker will discuss um, how uh, it's a variable um, changing industry and the impact on taxi drivers and worker exploitation. Firstly, we'd like, just like to say that we accept the opposition's definition. Now, I'd just like to address a few key points the first speaker has talked about. So she's discussed how we should be decreasing the regulation that's currently in place on Uber within South Australia um, and obviously within Adelaide. However, we believe that any decrease in regulation would only increase um, the issues that we're going to discuss in terms of safety um, and how the Uber service, which actually um, doesn't uh, provide the service but more provides a platform for the service, um, is quite a dodgy business and how any reduced regulation would actually be of detriment to South Australia and to Adelaide. Um, she also mentioned about how uh, there's choice and competition when we have Uber and Adelaide and when we have less um, regulation around Uber and Adelaide and how it decreases prices. However, as our second speaker will further discuss, um, Uber um, in its current form, um, once it bring, destroys the taxi industry, which she will explain, um, the prices of Uber can skyrocket. Uh, therefore, their argument about how it decreases prices actually doesn't really stand up. So firstly, I'd just like to talk about safety. Uber takes no legal responsibility as they outsource their workers. So they provide the platform in the app, but they don't actually regulate the workers. They don't um, check, really check who is working. Um, 
in comparison to how to taxi drivers who are trained to follow routes and are checked. Um, according to the Guardian, uh, Shiakuma Yuda um, in India was raped by her Uber driver um, and was allowed to drive for the company, which demonstrates that Uber is not safe. Um, which is just some international, and I'm just going to give some more international examples because right now there's not really a precedent um, in Australia because um, Uber hasn't really been around long enough to discuss about um, the problems with Uber. Um, also, according to the RAA, um, Uber does take no legal responsibility, um, which means that they take no responsibility for workers, for the cars, for the contents of the car, and for accidents and more. Furthermore, um, Uber distances themselves for a reason in terms of Uber services. Uber does not guarantee the safety or ability of third party providers, um, which therefore means that Uber doesn't actually have any control um, or want to have any control over their workers um, and over the cars that those people are using and there's no control over this business in that industry. Um, and currently in South Australia, with the regulation in place, it, it, aim, it aims really to protect that. So any reduced regulation, which is what the opposition has been talking about, would be only of detriment to the Uber service and to consumers in Adelaide. Furthermore, safety um, is a massive concern when we're looking at Uber. Um, and Uber employs people um, with just a criminal record check, but the check only lasts for two years. And there are many cases worldwide where uh, we've seen people that actually have criminal records be employed um, and gotten away with it. So there is an example of an applicant in America who cleared their safety checks, <clears throat> but he had 24 alices, 10 social security numbers, and a warrant out for his arrest when he was driving for Uber. Um, there are 173 currently lawsuits um, just in the UK alone against Uber, which shows how this business is actually quite dodgy it doesn't stand up to, say, industry regulations such as the taxi service in Adelaide and how any regulation we have in place at the moment about Uber is essential to be kept because of that industry and the problems with that. Also, I'd just like to talk about how when you order an Uber, the car that you're in uh, doesn't actually have any regulation um, apart from the fact that it has to be less than nine years old, that there are no safety checks or anything uh, such as... Um, you know, checking the brakes, checking the tyres, just basic things like that. But in comparison to the taxi industry currently, where it requires webcams and audio recordings and frequent checks and brake checks, you can just see the difference um, between having a certified industry standard and the Uber business, which doesn't actually provide any checks or safety or anything like that. Which just goes to show why Uber should um, keep being regulated um, and while we think maybe it should be legalised because then we can regulate it properly, which we have been doing in South Australia for several months, um, it, there should be no reduction in that legislation. So also the driver qualifications. Um, as a driver for Uber, you're not required to display your driver licence on the dashboard. And criminal record checks, as I've already mentioned, are only for the past two years. Um, and they have way less training uh, than taxi drivers and their background checks don't require fingerprinting. So you can technically use your phone's account. Uh, so to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, we aren't saying that we shouldn't have Uber in Ad Adelaide. We aren't saying that we uh, shouldn't be able to enjoy the service, which does have some benefits. We're only saying that we should remain um, with a level of criticism considering the international precedents uh, for safety concerns and things like that. So any reduction in the regulation would actually be to the detriment of, um, of the service in Adelaide and to the whole of uh, South Australia. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic for tonight's debate is that Adelaide should welcome Uber. As the affirmative team, we will convince you that this is most certainly the case. But first, let me point out some obvious flaws in the opposition's argument. 
The first negative is that there are no checks for Uber drivers, which means that it is a dodgy business and that it is unsafe. However, this is completely untrue because every Uber vehicle must have a safety check every six months. And the fact that the alternative of, say, a taxi service, which has had 200 suspended drivers, 8,075 fines, with 4,709 of these being speeding related in the past year in Adelaide. So if the safety is the issue here, then what is the safer alternative? They also stated that in India, that there was an instance that a passenger was raped. However, India is a third world country. And the fact that if you can to compare just India to Adelaide, then this is anecdotal fallacy because it is one example being generalised to the entire world. And the fact that if you can, were to compare the level of rape in India to the level of rape in Adelaide, then this is an instance that it cannot be compared because it does not, there's no connection between the two. And so it does, not, it does not stand up for itself being that we should not welcome Uber to Adelaide. My argument tonight will consist of two main points. The first being how welcoming Uber provides choice to consumers over their safety concerns. And secondly, how welcoming Uber into Adelaide is supplying a more efficient transport option to the consumer. Now to my substantive matter. Not only are there a great deal of economic benefits, such as the ones our first speaker has mentioned, but there are also benefits for the consumer on an individual level. Firstly, the welcoming of Uber into Adelaide has major safety benefits in comparison to taxis. According to the advertiser, over 200 of the state's employed taxi drivers have been suspended or fired as a result of indecent behaviour towards passengers. In addition to this, over 8,075 fines have been issued to taxi drivers with 4,709 of these being due to speeding related offences. Over a two year period, according to the Parliamentary Select Committee. In contrast, the relative fines accumulated by Uber drivers in cities such as Melbourne and Sydney was found in the same report. We completely understand that there will always be safety risks with all types of transport, including both public and private. So why should we welcome Uber? Uber has actively introduced features to allow riders to have increased peace of mind about their safety and allows them to make active decisions and choices about what makes the consumer feel safer. In a recent study conducted by the University of Adelaide, 55% of participants believed that they would feel safer in an Uber than in a taxi and 45% believed the opposite. This is an almost equal and undeniably proves the need for choice in our society. We are not suggesting that Uber are always safer than taxis, but instead the individuals should be able to make the choice regarding their safety. And welcoming Uber into Adelaide will allow more choice. There are many features present in Uber rides that are currently not present in taxi services including the ability to track their ride, see crucial information about their driver prior to their ride, and provide anonymous feedback about their driver and their trip. These features, currently not present in taxi services, allow consumers to actively assist in the improvement of the success of the service. Of course, not all consumers will feel and find these features necessary or see the need. However, the crux of the argument is that we value the choice that Uber provides to consumers and make decisions based on their need in our Adelaide society. The consumer drives the market and the ability for them to have choice over their safety proves why Adelaide should welcome Uber. This brings me to my second point, that Uber is without a doubt more efficient for the consumer than the alternative of taxis or public transport. The report by Deloitte Access Economics found people wasted an extra three minutes waiting for a taxi compared to the wait time of an Uber. 
This averaged to around 800,000 hours accumulatively. This is what the consumers want, a quicker option to get from point A to point B. And so why should Adelaide make it difficult and be unwelcoming for a service that is ultimately assisting with the running of life? The cost and hence efficiency of the Uber service over taxis is again in the favour of the Uber. Uber is cheaper to taxis. The same report found Uber trips to be almost 20% cheaper. And today, in society, people are always looking for ways to save money. And even though $6 might seem, might seem minute, in the bigger picture, people get excited to save around $0.08 cents per litre of fuel. And so, having a transport service that is saving consumers money is more efficient for them, and so ultimately should be welcomed into the Adelaide society. To summarise my argument tonight, I have proven to you that Adelaide should welcome Uber because it provides, provides consumers with choice over their safety and is supplying a more efficient transport option to the consumer. Adelaide should welcome Uber. Thank you, Speaker. Ruchika Lumba. So is lesser price and mere legislations without any subordinate delegated legislations, supporting acts or any forms of regulation more preferable over safety concerns that normal civilians have in Adelaide? Yes, we are about to find out. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. The topic for today's debate is that Adelaide should welcome Uber and as the negative team we definitely don't support the motion and we hope to prove to you that this is definitely not the time to welcome Uber. Our first speaker talked about safety concerns regarding Uber in Adelaide and Australia-wide. First of all, towards the customer who's sitting inside the vehicle and then to the vehicle itself and the drivers who are driving for Uber. I will be talking about the variable pricing that Uber has, the impacts that it has not only on the industry but also on individuals who work as drivers for both Uber and the taxi industry. But before moving on to my points, I'd like to address a few rebuttal points from the opposition's team. The first speaker went on to point out an example of Western Australia where it said that it is doing a great job in there and that it is providing a lot of jobs. But Uber for Western Australia only represents 12% of the entire Australia in terms of jobs. But more than 17% of all drivers in Australia for Uber have said that they felt a decreased opportunity for employment and a further 14% feel threatened for their employment. The second speaker went on to talk about how India is a third world country and hence its precedence shouldn't be applicable to a country like Australia. But the point is, it is the largest democracy where Uber is 27 times a larger industry than Australia. So although there are problems of other countries, I will in my speech address a few problems from Australia and America, which are first world countries, which will probably be relatable to this topic. They talked about how it is safe and how it is more friendly to the customer, but the safeguards for Uber have been at the discretion of the companies and, not, uh, and are not standardized according to the Passenger Transport Act 1994 South Australia. Moving on to my point, one of the major drawbacks of Uber is the surge pricing. So for normal people, surge pricing is just a method of increasing or decreasing the fee depending upon demands, the number of cars, number of passengers and the amount of travel that's done depending on the traffic. With Uber, it's unpredictable because sometimes it increases linearly, sometimes by a slight percentage sometimes twice, thrice, and sometimes exponentially. For example, Mr. Chris Green, a man in Perth, travelled 20 kilometres, where Uber charges about $1.86 per kilometre on an average. So the total fare should have been around $37.31. But he was in for a surprise when he reached home because he was handed a bill of $332.6, uh, $6, I'm sorry, which is about 8.9 times greater 
than the actual price. And the only reason being, the taxi was called at 1.30 a.m. Conversely, if this were a taxi, they would have a fixed, fixed fare, which would have been about $2.50 per kilometer. Yes, I know that's relatively expensive, but under Passenger Transport Act, this is fixed nevertheless. No differences in time, distance traveled, amount of cars on road, amount of drivers available changes this. Moreover, according to the advertiser, Uber startup cost in Adelaide has been around $700 for one person maintenance, which is uneconomic as compared to a mere $45 per tax season Australian Capital Territory and about just $100 in New South Wales. And thus the government has rejected this as completely inaccurate. The opposition has also talked about indirectly as to how they have lower prices, it's more customer friendly and that we need to have a choice. But then have they thought about the impact on the driver though? Drivers bear most costs from car costs, gas, maintenance, insurance, and everything, and they still have to give a share to Uber anyway. This affects their earning. Drivers work for longer hours, which jeopardize their safety and that of the customer, because it not only impacts their financial condition, but also their psychological condition. For example, a man in northern New South Wales who drives for Uber, that's an Australian example, he earns only $3 an hour after deducting all costs that he spends on everything. And another case of misuse is the improper background check, as we've already mentioned. There are no recording devices. A first world country case, that is of America, is that verbal abuses were heard at, an, at a Mexican in US in an Uber taxi, which could not be proven because there was no recording device. However, since the taxi was parked, there, was a, there were a few bystanders who overheard and thus they, called in, they were called in for questioning and they gave in their account of the thing. So, in terms of jobs, for every 570 jobs that Uber creates in Australia, where it is running, it, like, for example, specifically New South Wales and Australian Territory, about, uh, about 1,067 people in the taxi industry lose, lose their jobs according to Canberra Times. This only implies a monopoly of Uber and a totalitarianism, and we know what it has done to the world anyway. So in conclusion, flooding the market with new service providers, which creates a lot of competition, decreases the market share and the overall profits of drivers, who bear all brunt costs for this type of transportation. So we're not saying we have to ban Uber, but we definitely have to rethink about our options and have more definitive legislation in place before we can actually proceed on lowering the red tape. So we need that skepticism before we actually reach, reach a decision. Thank you. So tonight we're talking about whether or not Adelaide should welcome Uber. So basically the key ideas that we've been talking about tonight in this argument are the role of regulation and control and whether it's important and how that relates to whether or not we should welcome Uber. We've also talked about the power of the individual and the importance of the consumer in a market such as the market for transport in Adelaide and how that relates to whether we should welcome Uber. And we've talked a lot about this idea of choice, which is a really, a really like, in, pardon me, Bad anyway, a really important um, factor in this argument about welcoming Uber as this um, very innovative business. So the opposition has brought about these three main arguments. They've talked about safety issues associated with Uber. They've talked about its variable pricings and the effects on consumers. And they've also talked about the effects of, of the Uber service on the Uber drivers. So starting off with the safety aspect. Um, the opposition's talked a lot about how the Uber platform, it's not regulated and how um, Uber hasn't got these regulations that are associated with the taxi industry. But we believe that 
The opposition is really setting up this argument to be quite black and white. Should it be Uber or should it be taxis? But that's really not the point of the argument. The argument is that we're suggesting that Adelaide should welcome Uber. Whether or not it's better than taxis is irrelevant. We're just saying that we should welcome Uber into Adelaide to provide choice to the consumer and give the consumer more options with regard to their personal transport. So to say that Uber is not as regulated as, as taxis is probably true, although there are a lot of regulations and red tape that they're facing at the moment. But the point of Uber, as stated by Uber, is to change the logistical fabric of cities around the world. They want to change the way that we view personal transport. And so we should be welcoming Uber into Adelaide to be a more innovative and, um, and a more modern city. So... The opposition brought up this argument to do with safety and regulation um, regarding an example of a woman who was raped in India. And we have talked about this already. The first speaker, sorry, the second speaker already talked about how this example is slightly irrelevant. And I'd just like to point out that Uber currently runs in 488 cities and the opposition's only really brought up a couple of cases of um, the abuse in the US and uh, this woman who was raped in India and we don't really think that that is an argument not to welcome Uber into Adelaide because these issues are quite isolated. They're just involved in a few individuals and there are issues associated with taxi drivers as our second speaker has already pointed out. Um, so we're not suggesting that there should be a complete deregulation of Uber. We're just saying that we should further welcome it into Adelaide's society because it will be beneficial to the consumer. And that's really our main point in this argument. So it's also important to note that Uber has this rating system. And while whilst it's not perfect, it's extremely innovative and it's extremely creative for the modern society who really wants to be in touch and that have that connection really brought together between the consumer and the producer who is the Uber driver. So that relationship between the Uber driver and the customer, the fact that they can both rate each other, is a really important thing to consider when we're talking about safety and we're talking about the importance of consumers having choice. So we really believe that in terms of the safety aspect, the opposition hasn't provided enough evidence to suggest that Ubers are too dangerous for us to welcome them. And there are dangers in both cases. So it's not really only a two-sided debate and, it, and it's not just related to us welcoming them. So moving on to this idea of variable pricing and price surges. Okay, so we're talking about price surges. Yes, it's annoying. Yes, we agree that price surges for these different reasons are not beneficial for the consumer. But we're talking about consumer choice. That's the whole argument that we're discussing here. We're saying that the we should welcome Uber because the consumer should have choice. If they do get charged these extra surge prices, um, it's not the fault of welcoming Uber and saying that Uber's worse because they charge surge prices. It's, we're simply saying that consumers should have that option. If they do get charged extra, that's not the concern of the policymakers and the people who affect, um, who affect those uh, policies with regard to welcoming Uber and um, cutting the red tape. We're just saying that consumers should have that option. And if consumers do prefer Uber and they are happy to pay those prices, then that is their choice. And that's really the crux of the argument. They should have that choice. So finally, the opposition talked about the effect on Uber drivers. And again, it comes back to this main argument about choice. We're talking about choice here, okay? We want to welcome Uber because we believe that consumers should have choice, but also the drivers have the option of whether or not they become an Uber, Uber driver. Uber isn't forcing anyone into that profession. They're not forcing anyone to become a driver. This man from New South Wales who's saying he was mistreated by Uber, as brought up by the opposition, he didn't get forced to become an Uber, Uber driver. No one said that had to be what he did. That was his personal decision. And if he wanted to join the taxi ranks, that's his decision. That doesn't affect whether or not we should welcome Uber into Adelaide. Um, so finally, they talked about the dangers associated. Well, they did talk again about the dangers associated with Uber and who bears those costs um, before... Uh, and they discussed this idea of what, that we should 
introduce regulation before we lower the red tape, which I found rather confusing because they were saying that, yes, we do agree we should lower the red tape to make consumers benefit, but at the same time, we need the regulation so that the drivers don't get exploited. So it was very confusing, I felt, um, in that regard. So we believe that it's important that we have choice. Thank you. Speaker Sophie Ladd. Good evening, everyone. As we all know by now, the topic of today's debate is that Adelaide should welcome Uber. We of the negative team obviously believe this to be false. Um, today we started off by talking about the safety concerns. I was going to talk about safety concerns of Uber and there's no practical way to legislate it because of Uber's um, marketing business model of being a provider of the service to allow people to hook up rather than um, them being responsible for the drivers. And our second speaker has talked about the negative effects of it on the taxi industry and also the mistreatment of employees that occur um, as a result of the Uber system. Um, today I'll be rebutting the opposition's case and summarising our points further. Um, a big theme, obviously, as the third speaker made incredibly apparent for the opposition, was choice. Um, We'd like to point out that choice is not the crux of the debate, rather the crux of their argument. That's their case. That's what they've centred themselves around. The, and the um, topic is about welcoming Uber. And by their own definition, they define welcoming Uber as reducing legislation. And we'd like to point out that having a choice and having no legislation are not mutually exclusive. You can have a well-legislated, properly run, properly legalised business, and it can still exist. When it, we never said that we should not have Uber. So the choice can still exist, it's just by the opposition's own definition that we believe it should be properly legislated and we should not be decreasing the so-called red tape um, surrounding it. We should keep a healthy scepticism when um, approaching Uber and the, Uchis, and the Uber scheme and business model. Um, the opposition talked about how it's the person's decision if they want to use Uber and it's their decision to get on board with a driver. It's, um, it's that if they make a choice to do something to hop on a dodgy driver's vehicle, let's say, that's their decision, they have the decision to choose not to do that. However, we as a society have decided that people have the right to be protected by dumb choices. That's why we have fences near cliffs. We have decided, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes people make bad decisions and we have decided that we should protect people from a missed call in judgement. To do otherwise would just be um, faceless victim blaming. A large um, point of the opposition's case was the idea that um, by putting Uber in, you create a more competitive market, um, prices will drop, and um, you will decrease barrier entries for the public transport market to give innovation within the market. However, the, at the um, market as it currently is, is, is a very grey area, it's a very new, the whole sharing economy idea is very new, and this free market and choice is dangerous as is, so to decrease the very slim legislation um, surrounding it already is a very bad idea. The idea of Uber getting cheaper and prices going down is true, that's because employee rates have been, um, have been reduced alongside it. Um, the person who bears the brunt of the cuts in price and the competitiveness of the market is the, is the um, Uber employees, not Uber itself. The increase in cost is, um, and the loss of legislation around that, and to reduce more rights would only serve to increase the lack of protection that the Uber drivers have. They are treated as a third party um, corporation within that are uh, outsourced by Uber, not members of Uber. As such, um, the opposition mentioned how most Uber drivers come from disadvantaged, low unemployment areas, and that is because these are the people who are willing to accept the extremely lower wage, um, wages. As reported by Business Insider, even though Uber claims to um, produce a healthy wage, saying that people can earn up to $90,000 a year, um, that statistic is taken from um, drivers who work 40 plus hours a week and excludes the driver crosses. So that's their gross in intake, but doesn't account for things like gas, insurance, parking, repairs, and all the extra fees that are on the driver, because once again, the driver is the third party. They are responsible for all fees surrounding the car and the business, not Uber. Um, a case brought up by our position, a, uh, uh, our, our team, sorry. A New Jersey driver who drove for 12 hours in one day made a $100 gross sum. However, after accounting for tolls, Uber's cuts, gas insurance, self-employment taxes, 
and a variety of other fees as profit was only $54.50 after 12 hours of driving, which equals about $4.54 per hour, which was in the US, it's not a third, it's not a third um, world country example, it's just that cuts, um, the prices started up high to encourage drivers to sign up, but they've increasingly been dropped. And as the base wage drops and decreases over, um, continuously, the driver rights decreases and it becomes more and more difficult um, for drivers to make a good living. Also, with um, drivers in the lower socioeconomic areas, those are the people you're encouraging to drive, it's more likely for them to have, uh, let's say, a less new car, a less expensive car, a less safe car. And with um, the uh, position mentioned the safety checks, those six month safety checks are the driver's responsibility, not Uber's responsibility. If the driver just says, yep, we did the check, then that's, then that's good enough for Uber. Uber is not legislated in any way as it currently is. Uber, on its own terms of service, does not guarantee the safety or ability of third-party providers. That is a quote taken directly from Uber's terms of service. You drive at your own risk. As such, to reduce the Uber legislation is a very bad idea. And um, with the case of India and now, that was rejected on the case of being a third grounds country. However, a similar case occurred in Texas where a driver previously con um, convicted and spent 14 years in prison for drug charges was also convicted of raping a um, passenger on April 2015 last year. The background checks are inadequate. They only check the crimes that have occurred in the past two years. They can be easily circumvented and they are circumvented. And every year we find many cases of drivers um, being convicted and being put out of Uber and committing crimes as a result of that. Um, and, the safety, and the rating system is, is a problem as well, where people being incentivized to do bad behavior, such as putting in extra passengers and kids without child, and putting in children without um, child restraints to um, get a good rating system. So in con um, conclusion, Uber's legislation should not, um, not be reduced and should not be welcomed into Adelaide because of the problems outlined above. Thank you. It's been 25 years that our organisation has been running our debate. So this year is our 25th anniversary, and um, it's also the anniversary of the internet. It's absolutely no connection, but it just gives us a bit of authority and kudos, I suppose. But what we're doing this year is we're having a celebration to celebrate our 25 years, and what better way than having a debate? So we're going to have a debate at Pembroke Senior School in Holden Street, the topic is that age and treachery will always overcome youth and naivety. <laughs> so the three speakers are three uh, students from various schools will be the, uh, the children's team. And the um, adult team is, first of all, and actually you look all more my age, so you probably know who I'm talking about. Sometimes the parents are really young and they've got no idea. So um, you'll all remember who the person who's now the uh, very... the. Um, very Reverend Dr. Lynn Arnold, who used to be our uh, Premier, so he's one of the speakers. And Professor Rick Saar, who's the Professor of Law at Uni SA, and Dr. Manuela Klinger Hoffman, who's a researcher in cancer at Adelaide University. And they will be debating the opposite to their age, and the young ones will be debating the opposite to their age. Um, so nothing's uh, just adds a bit of a kick to it. It's an evening, it starts on the 22nd of October, that's right, 6 o'clock to 8.30, there'll be champagne and really, really yummy food. I know the food's like, uh, very yummy because that's the lady who catered for my wedding. So, um, <laughs> so we think it'll be a really nice, fun night, tickets are $20. Now, James downstairs has some little gizmo, I'm not very technologically advanced, he's got some sort of gizmo that you can actually buy your tickets tonight. So I urge you to buy your tickets. Uh, we'd love to see you there and help us celebrate our 25 years as a uh, um, competition. 
Okay, enough torture. Um, we don't usually give any kind of uh, feedback for uh, the semi-finals. If somebody's really interested, if the adjudicators so feel compelled to speak, they can answer any questions that you have. Um, so I'm just going to, first of all, I'm going to give the debating award, which goes, this was unanimous, to Sophie Ladd for an excellent debate. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was a unanimous decision. Oh, first of all, I've got to say that for the students to get to this point in the year, debating year, has required an enormous amount of work, work for themselves, trying to catch up with each other, preparing their debates, and it also is uh, an enormous amount of work for their teachers, coaches who help them, and of course the parents who support them and or drive them to and from their debates. So I'd like to say thank you to everyone who's been involved this year with their students. <laughs> okay, without uh, further ado, a uh, split decision actually, right. but the debate is awarded to the negative team. Oh, oh, oh. I call a member of the runner-up team to give a vote. Thank you. Um, so on behalf of my team, we would just like to thank everyone for coming out tonight in this weather, have a safe trip home. <laughs> um, thank you to the adjudicators for coming out and adjudicating this debate. Thank you to Miss Cohen for this amazing season and getting us as far as we've gotten. Thank you to the timekeeper chairperson and the opposition for an amazing debate and congratulations on your win. Good luck at the next round. <laughs> upon a member of the winning team to second that vote of thanks. So once again, thank you to everyone for getting us here and sitting here and listening to us talk about things. Um, thank you <laughs> to Bay USA for running the um, project. Thank you to the adjudicators for volunteering your time. Thank you, Chairperson, and of course your opposition for giving us a fantastic debate today. It was a really good one. Thanks, Ms. Manning Bennett, for timekeeping for us all the time. <laughs> member. And um, yeah, no, thank you everyone for the season. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. I now declare this debate closed.